Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Hello, Patrick Dunaway here, news editor with the Irish Farmers Journal. I'm joined with editor of the journal, Justin McCarthy, and market specialist Phil O'Neill to discuss the publication of the Beef Factory Price League in this week's paper, which is a follow-on from last week's KPMG Irish Farmers Journal Milk Price Review. Phil, to you first, what are the top-line figures coming out of the Beef Price Review? Uh, I suppose the striking thing out of this review is the change that has occurred from the last time we conducted this exercise in 2012, which was based on 2011 farm gate prices. Back then, it was the independent factories that would have been in the higher positions in the table, and uh, the groups, the large groups, ABPs, the key packs, and Dons weren't quite as strong. We have a complete reversal of that situation this time round, uh, whereby on steers, heifers, and young bulls, it's ABP and key pack in particular that dominate, uh, with Don coming behind, and then uh, the independents. On the cow trade, it's a totally different picture. Uh, where the independent factories would totally dominate the scene this time with the groups occupying the lower positions. What resulted in this shift in the space of three, four years? I think that reflects uh, the weakening of the mainland European market, particularly the former star performing markets in Italy and France. They are now lagging considerably behind Ireland in farm gate prices. In the same period, uh, the UK market has went from being uh, behind those two markets to now being the main market in Europe by a considerable distance. Uh, That accounts for 50% of Irish beef sales, so that gives us, uh, I suppose, the opportunity to get some of that spin-off, although nowhere near as much of it as we feel we should be, because we're producing the exact same product uh, with the same quality assurance standards, and yet our prices are selling several cents behind UK prices. In fact, the gap between Ireland and the UK has widened in the intervening period from what it was back then. Justin, to you, when Phelan discusses and talks about mainland Europe and the markets where they are, Do we place too much of an emphasis on those uh, and just outline how important those markets are to us? Yeah, I think uh, what what Phelan said there in terms of the dominance of the British trade is actually very true. And yeah, we do place uh, a lot of emphasis on that British market. Uh, It consumes around 50% of our beef. Whereas mainland Europe, Phelan probably taking in around 45 with a small amount exported, uh, exported outside. We're very lucky to be in a position, let's be clear, because if you look at the French price and the Italian price in this film's uh, special feature shows this week, it's something that really shocked me, in that traditionally Italian prices would have trumped the Irish price by 80 to 90 cent a kilo at certain times. Today, the Irish prices are actually ahead of the Italian prices by somewhere filling in around 50 cent a kilo and, a, and at a similar level for, yeah. for the ore, depending on which grade you take. And that, that really is a sea change. And for those listening that are maybe looking at the live export market, that's going to be uh, very, very relevant this year because it takes about 70 euros to get a weanling out to Italy. It ain't going to be going out if the price in Italy that it's going to be got is going to be less than in Ireland. And I think that's the big challenge, Philem, that maybe you'll be going into more detail on next week is in terms of making sure that we stay there. But we are riding very high on the back of a very strong British market. I suppose that's the fact that Irish beef is seen, seen to be of equivalent standard of Britain and we can't rule out the exchange rate difference. We have a 10% swing in exchange rate since the start of the year, Phelan, and uh, that's certainly given us another benefit. But the challenge is to make sure we stay there. If I might just pick up on a point there too, we referred to you know the, the large groups being strong and the steers, heifers, young bulls. Uh, there are a number of the independent factors we have categorised the rest uh, as the independents. There are who are those, Phelan? The number of those that uh, would be performing very, very strong there as well, who also have access to the UK retail market and would also have a strong factory presence in the UK in some cases. In particular would have in mind their Foyle and uh, Dumbia who would be relatively small presence in the Southern Irish market but they have a strong presence in Northern Ireland and they have also factories in Britain as well. So that uh, would give them a toehold there. Another interesting one there as well uh, Jennings who would be strong in the Irish retail market would also be very prominent in terms of the uh, Steer and Heifer uh, price leagues as well. Foil usually, you know, are always traditionally seen as paying the highest price. Is it part of the independent group there? Has it diluted what, what they pay or uh, seem to be paying in the, in the league? No, if we take all of the independents together, of course, then you, you get the average. But within the independents, the point I'm making is that there are a number of very strong performers that have just highlighted there. I'm thinking of Foyle, I'm thinking of Dunby, I'm thinking of Slaney, in fact, who omitted earlier. They are all very, very strong performers on the back of the UK retail business they have. And also by virtue of the fact that they are part of groups that have a strong presence in the UK. 
Yeah. Justin, talk to me about the significance of this. We're always open about price transparency and knowing what the farmer gets, but just why the fields need to do this again after the gap yeah. of a few years? Okay, Patrick, we, we, we did this consistently right up until 2012, and then you had the QPS come in. and So the QPS, the quality payment system, which really did turn the, the old traditional payment system on its head where it was generally flat rate pricing. So now we're, we, we've streamlined and invested in our own technology, and I think it should be pointed out the support of the Department of Agriculture in actually supplying us with these prices so we have streamlined that we have the farmers journal abg which uh, a lot of farmers now the average base grade which a lot of farmers are very familiar with so we have a more streamlined pricing and and we feel a more accurate pricing system so we decided to reintroduce it and really what what is it introduced for it's quite simple Everybody has different types of cattle and the film touched about that some factories are more prominent for cows and others are more prominent for steers and film mentioned ABP being at the top but a lot of ABP suppliers will know well they might not be a good customer for cows. These tables really show that so it's a matter of targeting the type of cattle that you have at the factory that's most active in that market and really we have a a full two page spread on what every individual factory uh, paid and I think it really is a very detailed piece of work. That's something that I would highlight in terms of we have commentary around, we have summaries, but it is worth taking some time to look at the detail in the tables. Uh, there's another point that we should make as well, of course. The tables that we present here include everything, basically the QPS, as Justin referred to, uh, VAT. And the other thing to be conscious of, that a good number of factories now have Angus and Hereford, some organic schemes, some little, th- those, whatever added premiums paid for those is included there. So those are reflected in, and that's worth keeping in mind as well crystal ball gazing time and we're sitting here in 12 months time what type of scenario do you think we'll be in personally i would be very happy if we could first and foremost hold for the rest of this year never mind 12 months time if we could hold our relative position compared with the rest of mainland europe and when we repeat this exercise at the end of the year i think that would be real progress given what happened in the second half of last year I, I would agree, Phil, with, with what you're saying. And, and just to pick up on a final point, Patrick, I think one of the big things we're seeing is the gap is getting wider between the top paying factories and the bottom paying factories. And I think the reason for that is that, especially, and it's very clear, Phil, with ABP, that they're chasing the spec that they're prepared to pay a premium for the animals under 30 months, under 380 kilos. And that gap uh, on the O-grade animal is 30 cent between the top and the bottom and 20 cent between the top and the bottom and the R-grade animal, 20 cent a kilo on a a 300 or 400 kilo carcass for ease of calculations, 80 euros. And that's between the top and and the bottom. But I think the big challenge now, Patrick, is the, the beef form. The beef form is probably taking place in the context of a much more stable market and probably a much better environment for discussion but we need to start tackling the real issues now in the beef forum and let's leave aside what may be politically popular and look at what the core issues are around beef labeling restricting the live export of cattle throughout the british isles and why are we not looking at pgi status for irish beef as well we need to think outside the box and i suppose farmers are really hoping that that beef forum will deliver to the extent that we're not here in 12 months time when extra cattle come on the market and things start to revert back to the normal course. So then that's raised the fundamental problem that the marketing of beef hasn't changed or altered at all really in the last 30 years even that it's it's we, we take out the the steaks and we take out the mince and after that you know the carcass is generally underused. Is, I, is there I, more I, I would disagree with you up to a point there Patrick I think it has changed fundamentally in the last 30 years. 30 years ago we were producing purely for uh, government assisted intervention buying programs at an EU level. We were shipping it to third countries heavily subsidised with serious support. Uh, over the past decade, I would suggest, uh, maybe 15 years, uh, the Irish beef industry has developed markets for all of the product that is, is now being sold freely and without support across the European Union. Uh, and it has actually shown, even within the last five years, a tremendous change in the profile of customers and an upgrading of customers and an upgrading of the relative position of Ireland in the European beef leg. We are the best euro land paying beef country today in terms of farm gate prices. I think that's something we can be very happy with. Nothing to get complacent about. Mm but certainly something to build on. I think the challenge there, Phil, is though, whenever those few extra cattle, and maybe, Patrick, that's what you were referring to, whenever those few extra cattle come in the system, prices tend, tend to go down. We need to use the position we're in today to put a foundation under the market that we stay where we are. I absolutely agree with that. Justin, Phil, thanks very much. And, of course, extensive coverage in this week's Irish Farmers Journal on the uh, Beef Price Leagues and more on farmersjournal.ie. Thank you. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie.
Now, what do farmers make of our farm gate price review? Last week I was in West Cork and I met Harold Kingston, known to the Irish Farmers Journal as one of our farmer writers. He had a special interest in the result of our KPMG Irish Farmers Journal milk price review. Harold, uh, 2014 IFJ KPMG Milk Review, which is published, Barry Row, your own co-op, came out on top. How does it feel, I suppose? No, three in a row for Barry Row at this stage. First of all, I suppose there's a certain amount of pride in the fact that uh, a co-op that has been built up by farmers in the area um, since uh, I think it was 1925 or six that it was formed has delivered again for us. There has been a lot of work put in by farmers into developing a, a broad range of uh, interests within the co-op. It's not just milk, uh, and certainly that has been a help to um, to maintaining it. It costs to set it up, but it's it's been a, a help to maintaining the milk price at uh, trouble sometimes as well. Having having an, a, a range of interests and all the investments that have been made have been made very prudently by the farmer uh, co-op members. And that's exactly it, as well as kind of good solids and whatnot in, in Barry Road. It's the shrewd investments, the money that's going in that is being brought back to farmers. It's a, it's a co-op and a board that's working well. Yeah, it's a board that's working well. It, it's been streamlined at, at the moment where the, the number of members is, is dropping and streamlining it a bit just to, it ma- makes it easier for, for business, uh, I suppose, as well to, to run it better. We're a small area. Uh, we've been extremely lucky with the foresight of, uh, of farmers uh, in the area to purchase well originally do a deal with express dairies to set up carberry and then to come together as the four west cork co-ops and buy out carberry milk products because that has been the making of west cork really the innovation and the level of of research and development that goes in there is phenomenal so it's not cheap but it's paying dividends if you take for instance one of the the big famous cheeses that we we make is dubliner cheese and that particular cheese was an experiment that didn't go right it was a mistake and they discovered Dubliner and it's a fabulous cheese and, and certainly is delivering for us now. And without putting in that investment uh, into research and development, it wouldn't be there now. The way is where the profit is being made out of Carberry now, which was the waste product. Uh, so there is nothing wasted from the milk when it goes in there uh, and it's delivering. And look, fast forward to 2015, it's going to look obviously a little bit less attractive, but mm. where do you think that milk price will settle for the year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, 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 normally, normally interviews start start with the uh, the tough question. Um, yeah, look, it's 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 obviously dropping a little bit. It's not going to be as uh, what what's that people said at the start a, a brutal milk price year. It's certainly held up a long way. There's probably another since looks like coming off. Uh, how how soon? Uh, I certainly would hope that markets have stabilized enough to to hold milk price at the moment and uh, there is rumors of a, of a cent coming off i would certainly hope that it wouldn't come off in this particular month uh from my own point of view of course i'm drying off shortly with some of my uh, autumn calvers and I'll, I'll need to make sure that when it comes to the next autumn that there'll be a price building up again um because uh, it's crucial that uh, that there would be a price to deliver back to pay all the bills the fact of being in winter milk as well myself and seeing what it delivers for west cork um, it's the only group really now delivering a proper price for a winter scheme. Uh, and that is helping the overall product mix within Carberry as well. It's rising the price, not because of the bonus that's being paid, because there's only one pool of milk to actually pay the price back to farmers. Uh, so the bonus has to come out of that pool. But because of having a constant supply of quality milk with no peaks and troughs as much as other co-ops, by not having in the spring having all fresh milk and the autumn having all tougher processed late lactation milk, that supply of milk is actually meaning that there can be a bigger and, and better range of, of quality products made from Carberry. And that's helping the price too. So overall, less positive than last year, but mm. it's still going to be not a doom and gloom year of 2015. Well, it, it's certainly a bit of doom. I suppose what has what has been the big help is the fact that the costs this year haven't been as as bad as uh, say zero nine. No, we we ran into costs um, because of weather conditions and different things. The input prices have certainly been a been a problem. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be a, a year to celebrate, uh, as it were. Look, as farmers, we have to be prepared for a bit of volatility, uh, and volatility means that the price has to come back up again. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Staying with the milk markets, the Irish Farmers Journal dairy specialist Aidan Brennan recently met Mike Murphy, the influential cork farmer and businessman who was interested in New Zealand and in the US. We've seen global milk prices fall again this week, and Aidan asked him what his outlook was for the coming months. Aidan, for the last 12 months I've had a view will say that, um, that there's a very strong probability that uh, they don't turn on milk prices 
will be much longer than usual. Based on what, Mike? Just, just instance, three things. First one is actually hopeful, that stocks are actually not huge, so that if the uh, supply-demand balance gets better, prices could bounce back very quickly. So these are stocks of milk powder and butter and around and, the world. And around world. Okay. They're not as high as they often have been uh, you know, in, in a bad period. Mm -hmm. So there's a possibility of a quick bounce back. But to do that, that, that either demand grows a bit quicker, our supply contracts yeah. uh, or do, doesn't grow as quickly as it has been. I'm not too optimistic on the demand side because I think, you, you know, that uh, politically, Russia, mm. Ukraine, mm. Uh, as against the West, I, I don't see that being settled in the near future. Yeah. Hope I'm wrong. The second one will say that um, China, China's uh, purchases of commodities generally have slowed a bit. You could probably make the point that nobody knows exactly what the Chinese yeah. will do next. Uh, so hopefully they'll come in and buy more heavily in the market for dairy products. But uh, again, it, it doesn't seem likely this will happen. The recent stock, in the last few days, we've seen, seen stock markets fall in China. Is that going to exacerbate the problem? It indicates there's a nervousness about exactly where China is, we'll say that. Mm -hmm. uh, but personally, I don't think China is going to collapse. But I mean, I think the amazing growth rates of the last 30 years, they had to slow. Anybody who's projecting in terms of the increase in dairy products, the rate of increase and projecting that into the future, I think was just too optimistic. So this supply demand, it's difficult to see it being solved on the demand side. Mm. On the supply side, traditionally, we we'll said that the US was the one that buckled mm. uh, and organized coke kills and so on. That is just not going to happen. Under the 2013 Farm Bill, the way they ensure their corn crop has more or less meant that they're they have bigger crops. Personally, I think it's a subsidy. Many farmers will say, if you have a good crop, you win. And if you have a bad crop, you win. It has led, if you like, what's that, to, uh, to more grain being there. And that's very important for an industry that feeds four or five tons mm. per cow. Yeah. It's much more important than, uh, the, in our case, of feeding two or three or four hundred or five hundred kgs of meat per cow assisting from four or five tons. But the, the other side of it is the farm bill will say where uh, farmers uh, in the last 18 months have risk control measures that the feed and the milk price are taken into account, you can in effect ensure yourself so that even in a bad year you still have a margin. So right at the moment, uh, even though the dairy farmers are hurting a bit around the world, mm. that is not actually the case in the States of the main players that are getting the best milk price at the moment. Beef prices are amazing, inputs are cheap, grain is cheap, and they're happy. They're not going to be the ones to be cut back. If this is going to be, you know, the present situation, it's going to be solved by a cut back in supply. It will happen by a cut back in supply by attrition, either in New Zealand, where they're hurting very badly, mm. or in Europe, where the higher cost farmers uh, are beginning to hurt now, we'll say. Mm. So I think this could easily go on for another six, nine months. Okay, and that long? I, 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 I think so. I think there's a very strong case for farmers looking inside their own businesses and looking at their own costs and going to the grass rich certain mm. route and looking to the future with volatility. We're always going to have a down year every three or four or five years. The lower the cost base, there's a lot to be said. The last man standing, that's a great position to be in. Yeah. For Irish farmers, what are the two or three first things they should be doing within their own farm gate to cut their costs? There's kind of a, a short term or a longer term answer. Longer term will say that over two, three, four yeah. years, grow a hell of a lot more grass, concentrate on having highly fertile cows, calving compactly. Get and if, if you fall into that system, you're going to have a low cost anyway. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's necessary mm. to invest in things like land fertility. Yeah. I heard that the more park open day, the question was asked, you know, that in a year like this, so when milk prices don't, it's not the year to invest in land fertility. Mm. My answer would be that 2014 was certainly the year yeah. to actually invest. Yeah. Uh, and in a, in a good year, get that land fertility right. And It's like uh, money in the bank. It's like money in the bank. Farmers who are aware of a worsening market outlook, they really should have actually made provision in 2014 for 2015. Yeah. Buy some inputs. Understand, we'll say, that you, you're going to have a carryover kick on like in terms of your tax bill in 2015 mm -hmm. there's lots of things like so that. a reserve you're talking about there whether that's in a, in stocks or money in the bank as you say in stocks by yeah uh, fertilizers or fertilizer or equally feed uh, feed in terms of uh, having more silage yeah. or whatever it's like money in the bank but also 
have some money in the bank. And instead of just blowing it, we'll say that, uh, buying uh, Tractor, right? tractors, unnecessary tractors mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. only rust, don't hit the things the business needs. Mm. Hit, we'll say, do you have to buy that car? Do you have to buy that tractor or whatever this year? Look at sort of uh, on the bank side. Are you trying to fund expansion out of short-term loans? Yeah. Uh, are overdrafts worse again? And should you restructure it over uh, four or five years or, or seven years or ten years or whatever? Match the expenditure with the proper length of borrowing. Milk price up to now has been reasonably solid, better yeah. than people predicted. Yeah. Do you think farmers should be proactive now when maybe going to their banks and discussing their needs for the next six months or a year? And maybe, you know, rather than waiting for them to come to you with a problem. Banks worldwide hate surprises. They're aware, would say, that it's going to be a difficult year for dairy farmers. So it's far better off to go in and don't, don't go in and start to borrow for the next couple of months. Make a plan like over at least 12 months and ensure that you have facilities enough to cater if this thing goes on for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and don't be going in and change. You're looking for more every two or three months. Creates a, a horribly bad impression. Banks can deal like, with a difficult period as long as you communicate it with them. We, we're all critical of banks, would say, but hopefully the very worst we've seen in bankers the last few years, hopefully that's yeah, in the past, would say, and we can go back to something like relationship banking mm-hmm. in the future. Mm-hmm. Like you have extensive interests in New Zealand. Yeah. Farmers there have experienced a sharp reduction in milk yeah. price over the last six to 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what, what lessons have you seen from, from New Zealand that could be brought back to Ireland if milk price is going to fall further here? There's a great many farmers in New Zealand are stocking each hectare with more animals than they can feed with grass. John Roach recently uh, did a paper with said a showing that, that there's one extra cow per hectare that is just being supported with bought in feed. It demands extra capital, a lot of extra work, more difficult decisions, higher risk, and it's dropping profits. So why are farmers doing it? And, and in fact, a very interesting one, I'll quote again from John Roach's paper, for every extra tonne of feed, a tonne of meal bought in, there was 1.2 tonnes of grass per hectare less actually consumed. Yeah. There was more than 100% substitution. And uh, the, uh, why go down that route? Higher profits are a direct function of keeping your costs low. And low cost is always driven by a high grass grass situation. Moore Park had the focus absolutely 100% right there on uh, the, the 1st of July. Yeah. What were your key messages from that day, Michael? Do not be dependent on somebody else paying off a higher price. Instead, yeah. take control of things yourself. And I thought that Moore Park, um, they did a great job with said that the core message of profitable dairying is feed the soil to feed the grass to feed the cows cheaply. Yeah. That is the core. And uh, the uh, other message is the importance of uh, fertile cows, the importance of having not three, not three and a half, uh, get five, five and a half, six, and uh, that it takes something like 1.6 lactations to actually even pay... To pay, pay back. back the cost of rearing the heifer. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. It does a massive solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. very strong message. Don't run systems that are dependent on high milk price. It's crazy. Mm. You you will have high milk prices at times. I wouldn't be pessimistic, you know, in the medium to longer term, but we'll say you will have years like this and perhaps even next year where you, if you're running a high cost system, you will be under severe pressure. Okay, Mike, um, thank you for your time. I think yeah. there's uh, some good lessons there for Irish farmers. Yeah. Uh, importance of grazing, high levels of grass, lowering your input costs, and, and, and keeping control of your business. Talk to you again soon. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Finally, the editor of Irish Country Living, Mairead Lavery, had a chance to interview the BBC's top gardener, Monty Don, ahead of his visit to Ireland later this month. Mairead told Kira Leahy about the lessons she took away from talking to him, on gardening of course, but also in life in general. Eileen O'Rourke and her crew down in Carlo mm-hmm. uh, for the Carlo Garden Festival were really the ones who brought Monty Don to my attention. Of course, I watch him every single week without fail. I think he's great. And um, he's over at the Carlo Garden Festival, which right. takes place from the 25th of July to the 3rd of August. And um, he's one of the guest speakers. So he's going to be in the Arboretum just outside Leyland Bridge on the 25th, Saturday the 25th. Okay. So you're excited to interview him? I, I was delighted to interview him. Yeah. Now, it was a phone interview. Right. 
So it's, you know, when I had a set period of time. Yeah. So there was no time for chat. You okay. Know, we basically got down to business and I was able to ask him, you know, a couple of questions from the programs that he'd been doing recently. And it was just nice to get that kind of further information. Yeah. Obviously, you're big into gardening yourself. Yeah. And what did you learn from him when you were chatting to him? Well, the one thing I learned is, you know, I often think, because I saw a lot of spring bulbs, Mm -hmm. daffodils and snowdrops. And I do often think, even though, you know, I'm kind of not long in the tooth yet, like what will happen to my lovely daffodils and snowdrops when I'm not there? I'm not so worried about the herbaceous borders, but the bulbs, yes, because they come back year after year. They're like Miss Havisham's ghost when I'm (laughs) going to be gone. And what he said was that basically a garden is like a child. You know, you create it, you watch it develop, you watch it grow, you look out for it, you mind it. Um... But when you're gone, it's gone too. And you can't go back. So, like, really and truly, don't worry about a garden. If you leave a house, if you move somewhere else, yeah. if you're no longer there to mind it, never go back. That's an interesting approach, in it. You know, there's so many weekends you come back up to the farm centre and you say that you're gardening the whole weekend. And, you know, a lot of people find it... I um, read the whole weekend. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> but a lot of people find it very relaxing, you know, mm. a way of switching off. What did Monty have to say about that? Yeah, for Monty Don, a garden is a lot more than a place where you grow plants. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he finds it as a place of solace and he says, ask any voluntary gardener, volunteer gardener, what do they get when they come in out of the garden? And there is this sense of peace and this working with nature and working with the soil and watching things grow and develop. He says for our mental health, mm-hmm. he, he maintains that if you're strong, robust in your, your mental health, you don't need to be brought to do gardening, but if you aren't, if you have, like say he talked about young youngsters, teenagers that are off the rails or mm-hmm. people who have severe psychiatric illnesses, the time spent in the garden is really, really worthwhile. Now, he said that in the UK, there is consideration being made towards making gardening hours part of the NHS prescription. Wow. So if you are suffering from a mental illness or psychiatric illness or if you're a young person who's disturbed, um, so many hours in a garden would help. And one of the things he said was that there wasn't enough hard evidence that it worked. Mm -hmm. But somehow or another, it does work. And all the the, the anecdotal evidence would show that. So he's calling basically for more evidence-based research on the value of gardening towards people's mental and physical health. And he can see it as being part of a package with conventional medicine into right. the future. That's really interesting. That's, that's Yeah, that's well, that's, great, that's, yeah. that's, that's his, his view on it. Yeah. But I, I would think that. And then we also talked about gardening and being an optimist when you garden. Mm-hmm. You have to be an optimist when you garden because you see what's going to come. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't be out in November in heavy coats and wellingtons and freezing um, planting stuff unless you could actually, in your mind's eye, see what is what going, to, going be to be there. Yeah, absolutely. So he agreed with that, you being an optimist. That's great. Um, it was great to read as well about Monty's dog, Nigel, who seems to be the real star of the show. I actually couldn't believe it when I read that he even gets fan mail. Oh yeah, he gets fan mail, he gets presents, Christmas presents. And actually, if you watch the programme, it's a golden retriever. Yeah. Nigel, it's such a weird name. <laughs> Nigel is a golden retriever and he's he follows Monty everywhere and he sits there waiting and then he gets up and goes along with him. But he had a, he was jumping for a ball and he broke his back a couple, three years ago. Yeah, I've read that. And yeah. um, the prognosis was really bad. They were either going to put him down or amputate a leg. And Monty heard about this vet, Noel Fitzpatrick, who's from, hails from Ballyfin in County Leash mm-hmm. and who's working in, the, in England as a, an orthopaedic vet and really with a fantastic reputation. The, Nigel was brought to the vet. Five days later, he walked out to meet Monty Don and he's been perfectly fine ever wow. since. And he, what he has to say about Noel Fitzpatrick and about the skills he has and the compassion and the passion he has is something else. It's such a credit to the man. But Monty, he's a, he's a regular visitor to Ireland. He's Mm-hmm. His actual proper name is Montague Don, I imagine. Um, and he's had a, like a varied history, kind of left school early, got into one of the Oxford or Cambridge, mm-hmm. finished his degree. Himself and his wife went making jewellery. The company folded um, and, and, you know, he went back to gardening. And he said that himself and his two brothers were forced into gardening. They were marshalled into it. There was no getting away from it by their mum when they were teenagers. But as a result, by the time they were like left home, they had enough knowledge that would, you know, a gardening degree wouldn't fail. Right. And the knowledge has stayed with him. And he said his two brothers are keen gardeners and good gardeners. And he makes his living out of gardening. Yeah. Um, all from, from this, that, that stuff when they were young. And I use it now as an excuse for my kids. 
I guarantee you, you will love Garda. <laughs> you could be like Monty Dan. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, you can read more about that interview in this week's Irish Country Living. And Rachel, you might just uh, remind us again where we just can meet Monty next weekend. They can meet him in the Arboretum. Now, they really want to call Carlo Rural Tourism um, and the Garden Trail people. Mm-hmm. And the number there is 059-913-0411. Or they can also check it out on www.carlogardentrail.com. Brilliant. Thank you so much. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast online at farmersjournal.ie and on iTunes every Thursday. Brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy.